Welcome. Greetings, one and all. We are pleased to be joining you to, again live via UWI TV for this session, the second in the series, Building a Resilient Creative Future Beyond COVID-19, Perspectives from the Caribbean and Beyond. Our key question, one of the things we really wanted to get at, what does a Creative Caribbean reimagined for the age of coronavirus look like? And we are here live via UWI TV and on Facebook, bringing to you a full slate of speakers again today. I am pleased to introduce to you the fact that this is also a part of the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series. And I want to give thanks to the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education, Professor Wei Binti Wariboko from the University of the West Indies, who has been very supportive in our bid to give the humanities a, a rebranded look for the world. That in Jamaica, in the region, we are very much exploring the ways in which the humanities is always in action and that we are part of that action as scholars. It is incumbent upon us as a university to engage in thinking that will in fact prove useful to national development, regional development, and ultimately to global development. So we have a slate of speakers here for you this, 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 in this session. And I'm going to introduce to you now, Dr. Deborah Hickling, who will speak to us first. Her title, Cultural and Creative Industries in Perspective. She is the lecturer in Cultural and Creative Industries in the Institute of Caribbean Studies and coordinator of the Bachelors of Arts in Cultural and Creative Industries and as well the Entertainment and Cultural Enterprise Management Program at the UWI. She is Jamaica's representative on UNESCO's Expert Facility on Cultural Economy and Diversity. She's president of the Jamaica chapter of Women in Film and Television and convener of the Public Relations Society of Jamaica. Her first book, Decolonization 2.0, Cultural Economy and Television in Jamaica and Ghana, is forthcoming from Palgrave Macmillan. In addition to her academic pursuits, Deborah is an audiovisual producer and broadcaster of 30 years with a keen interest in media and development with service as deputy chair of Jamaica's Public Broadcasting Corporation and Creative Production and Training Centers, and as board chair of the Program Coordination Division at the Institute of Jamaica. Deborah brings a wealth of experience this morning, and I happily introduce her to share with you. Deborah. Thank you, Dr. Naya, and greetings, everyone. Putting the cultural and creative industries in perspective on the anniversary, in the anniversary month of the ICS gives me really great pleasure as one of its products. Today, I want to um, share a big picture political economy and policy perspective on the Caribbean cultural economy that I hope will put in context the discussions that are being brought to the fore during this series. So straight into it. Um, um, ah, there we go. As the world changes um, in response to the COVID-19 epidemic, we're all considering a system reset. To leave this thought process, I want to start with a very strange question. How can a simple cup of water, coffee or tea, make all the difference to how we approach a possible cultural and creative industry um, reset? Well, CCIs are about stories, so I'll tell you one now. Jamaica's Ministry of Labor and Social Security in the 1990s had a dreadful structural and reputational challenge in service delivery. They served the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable people in Jamaica. They began a process of a systems reset, and while they worked on structural matters, uh, their minister indicated that there were two things missing. 
She instructed them to put a water cooler and a tea station in all service areas so that their stakeholders would feel welcome and a part of the structural changes that were in effect. It made all the difference in humanizing the policy and the structural changes that were happening there. COVID-19 has reminded the world of an ethos of care, balance, and dignity, and of course, community, where many thought it may have been lost. Yet here we are quietly and steadily moving forward again, dragging the old normal along. Water, tea, and coffee are figurative. It'll take more than that to achieve a necessary reset of the cultural and creative industries. But the principle holds true. Follow me because this is where food for thought needs tangible bread and butter. Last week, using this medium, um, we, we heard from very important stakeholders within our cultural and creative industries ecosystem on a range of really important and practical topics that will help us to address the circumstances uh, presented to us by this dastardly opportunity of COVID-19. And we'll hear other, other of those perspectives today. Also, this week, CARICOM hosted its first regional dialogue on culture in a COVID-19 environment. Policymakers and stakeholders from across the region reported and commented on initiatives pre and post COVID. These are just two of the myriad discussions taking place globally. All over the world, these things are happening as they seek to prepare us for a period PC post COVID. We've seen in the news that the economic outlook is grim. But the business community and governments are seeking to implement short, medium, and longer-term programs to mitigate against the great unknown. And it's critical that this point is made. The future is absolutely unknown. So it's euphemistic to say anything that's planning for an uncertain future. Um, it, it's euphemistic to say that planning for an uncertain future is extremely challenging. So just to remind us of where we're coming from, pre-COVID, the Caribbean cultural and economy is one of glorious absurdity. I'm the first to say that. On one side, we have a great deal of um, positive things happening. And on the other side, we have some really dreadful things that need to be sorted through. There, there are traumatized creatives. There is great neglect happening and mistrust. But on the other side, there's a dynamic growing um, set of cultural and creative industries with increasing formalization and local policies. So within this dynamic ecosystem, we have a lot of young people who are emerging and a great deal of um, excitement and dynamism um, in, in informal contract and um, transient work. So again, we have this issue of the dialectic at work. Policy is in place, is, is being put in place across the Caribbean. Um, we have some countries that are further ahead than others, but these are some of the themes that are being examined in terms of, of policy development. And I have put some of the challenges that we have with, um, with, with cultural and creative industries policy in the Caribbean in four different categories. And these are they, but these, these are things we have to discuss again in the future. We have a socio-political environment that is, um, that is based on levels of inequity. And these are structural and institutional, and they cannot be forgotten as we talk about issues to do with cultural and creative industries. And of course, there is the issue of economic growth, which is slow, um, and sustainable de development, which seems to be slower. And this is another one of the contradictions that exist even as economic growth, we, we have a little bit um, growth kind of going positively, but slowly. So we have to ask ourselves at this point, have we optimally used this golden opportunity provided in the quiet of COVID to reimagine, redesign, et cetera, um, revisit, renew, reconsider, and reset? We also have to ask, what do we want our new normal to look like? And what of the old normal? And I'd like to also suggest that we in the Caribbean are very big on what to do. 
but we're very short on how to do it. And we certainly have not sorted out the clarity of why. We have n a number of, of um, programs, of studies that have told us about how to do all the various things that are listed on the right-hand side. But the issues of implementation and the philosophy of that, we are not as clear on those issues. So it's about finding the right balance. Chronics tells us about balancing the love and the likes, doing, doing it for the love and the likes. And there are a number of issues, again, that need to be balanced. And that's the major problem that we have in Caribbean cultural and creative industries policy. And I suggest that there are five specific areas that when we're creating policy for cultural and creative industries that we have to look at. And, um, the last set of speakers last week spoke, the, the main theme that ran through the, their entire present presentations was finding that balance, sorting through the various elements of, of, of balance in, across the um, areas and, and um, disciplines and issues. And that balance starts with a, a, the original premise of balancing, um, balancing the creative with the cultural, balancing the business with the discipline. And we, we tend to think that a balance sheet is more important than a manuscript of music, but both are really technical documents and neither is easier to read than the other by somebody who doesn't know how to read it. None is more important than the other. And we have to also be listening to the, the um, persons within the industry who on one side are telling us, yes, I need some quiet to do some work. I need to disappear into my habitat. And on the other side, I'm um, saying we need to get to work because we need to be um, getting involved in entrepreneurship. On the side of governance, we have um, international, regional, and local policies that are being implemented, that continue to be implemented over time. But again, there are imbalances that we know about. Economically, we have taken a classical neoliberal approach, and there are three specific issues, cream rising to the top, picking winners, and survival of the fittest. Now, there are challenges here because of the issues of balance. Ideologically, we are still teetering on the issues of are we involved in cultural economy or creative economy. We've not been able to identify what the, the real balance is for us. And ideologically, I, I've, I've heard a perspective that was of great interest to me. And that was a, a perspective that said, creatives believe they are special and different. And governments and financiers and business partners owe them something. And that's a part of the neoliberal ethos. It's a neoliberal implementation position that, that, is, that you can see in, um, that it was seen originally in the 1970s and 80s um, in, by, by um, Margaret Thatcher, who brought about, who ended the welfare state and took away all of the benefits that were due to cultural and creative industries, saying that they have to now take care of themselves. Thankfully, that was left in the 1980s, and cultural and creative industries moved on beyond that. The thinking about cultural and creative industries moved on beyond that. But we in the Caribbean are stuck there in the 1980s, thinking of issues of, um, as we, we need to think through the issues of neoliberalism. And the final one, um, philosophy, the thought process that fuels the conceptualization of CCI. Um, we haven't really, we have, we have not clearly thought that, thought that through. The enabling environment is written into the CARICOM plan, but is written as a strategic element. I'm suggesting that it needs to be thought through as an implementation philosophy. And that's based on two perspectives. The intervention framework, which focuses on cultural workers, focuses on the artist. I know you're going to hear about that from, from Ala Inka today. And it says specifically that cultural and creative industries practitioners, where we are now, pre-COVID, are at subsistence levels. They do not have the capacity to grow themselves, and they require a shift 
from cultures of extractionism, every tub have to stand up on their own bottom and um, cream rises to the top, to cultures of sustainability that, that, should, that, that speak about issues to do with balancing the notion of social good and advo ad advocacy content creation and commerce with the artist as being central to that particular ethos. And policy has to create that balance. And this, this is what I'm suggesting the, the policy model should look like, where it's um, production and trade, creation and inspiration are all areas that have equal balance in the minds and thoughts of the development of policy for cultural and creative industries. It does not exist at the moment in that way. And the, a group got together um, from CARICOM, UWI, um, and the CDB, um, and also UNESCO, and put together some very tangible. So this is not just about, um, about concepts um, and academics. These things now have to be translated and have been translated into tangible and practical ways of doing things. So as I close, um, let's think about that system reset. There are two things that need to happen. CCI practitioners need to begin to take themselves more seriously. Gillian um, Wilkinson McDonnell said last week they have to form groups, guilds, unions, associations, and they do, um, and because governments negotiate with institutions. On the other hand, we require a transparent, communicative public service and policy development um, agenda that engenders care and balance of this enabling environment as its philosophical core. We require operation restore dignity to the cultural and creative industries. As I remind you as I end, that it's our policies, it's our practices. We choose how we do them and as Bob said, Every man has to find, decide on his own destiny. And in this judgment, there is no partiality. So arm in arm, with arms, we will fight this little struggle because that's the only way we can overcome our little trouble. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you very, very much, Deborah. These are crucial questions that have been raised. COVID-19 being an opportunity for a system reset in relation to the cultural and creative industries, just, as the way, just in the way that we've been talking about um, a system reset for the economy, for health, and so on. You raise issues related to um, ideology, the philosophical, the liberal, the capitalist, the enterprise, um, and questions of policy. But of course, implementation and action are key questions for us, and of course, transparency. So we will continue to have those reverberate in the context of this session this morning and hopefully beyond as we think through how to get to implementation and action in the context of these bread and butter issues. Now I, I'm pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, Lydia Rose. Lydia is the general manager of the Jamaican collective management organization, Jamaica Association of Composers, Authors and Publishers, JCAP. Many of you would have heard of JCAP, and she's been the general manager since 2012. JCAP administers the rights of the composers, authors, and publishers of musical works, both locally and internationally um, within Jamaica. She, she holds a, an MBA in international business and a BSc in management and accounting from the University of the West Indies. She's currently pursuing studies at the Institute of Caribbean Studies, and she currently holds the post of chair for the management committee of the Association of Caribbean Copyright Societies, an organization formed by the four major rights management societies in the Caribbean. Um, Lydia is going to share with us this morning on the whole question of the future, protecting your creative future through rights management. Lydia. Thank you. Welcome to this um, forum. I want to thank the Institute of Caribbean Studies 
for inviting me to give a perspective from the intellectual side of how we protect the creators. Um, <clears throat> the topic today is protecting your creative future through rights management. And it is against the background of building a resilient creative future beyond COVID-19. But I would say that my perspective today is not just beyond COVID-19. For the creators, it is what we are experiencing during COVID-19 because we all did not expect that we would have been now in almost two months lockdown without the creative sector being back up on its feet. So that has totally um, eroded the earning ability of our creators. And I speak specifically to the songwriters of music who are the persons who write the music, the persons who are the composers, the musicians, and the publishers. For us, public performance in Jamaica is where it is. And intellectual property, according to, to UNCTAD, states that it is an expression of human creativity that are granted legal protection. Intellectual property rights are the legal rights that result from intellectual activity in the industrial, scientific, literal, and artistic field. Regulations aim to safeguard the creators and producers of these intellectual goods and services by granting them an exclusive right to how their contents are used. And we are now with COVID, where I say to persons who I speak to on a daily basis that it's almost that we have, COVID has put us back um, years because the use of copyright content, which has now migrated to, the, to online, to the internet, it's like it's a wild, wild west. Nobody remembers that the works were created. Someone had to write the book. Someone had to create the music, etc., in order for users to consume. And I just want to go through sharing um, four slides just to give the listeners a perspective on how rights management is managed. And then I will go into the discussion of how we intend to protect our, our, our creators at this time. So, as it stands, music licensing system. We are where the creator can do a direct licensing and as well as they can do semi-licensing. They can go directly to the user with their works or they can perform their works otherwise. And then we have the indirect licensing system where CMOs act as the intermediary between the users and the, those who want to use the music. During COVID or pre-COVID, our world was booming. Perform a live performance, touring for Caribbean creators brought a lot of economic value. Where <clears throat> when they tour, they're able to take with them persons, they're able to, to start <clears throat> doing what they do on a daily basis of going and performing at, in concerts, etc. As it stands now, touring is Touring right now is just 
not happening for our creators. We also, they also had where um, parties, and, 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 and I say every day, and it, has, it is known that Jamaica is a party capital of the world. Um, we had a party almost every day of the week. So creators were able to earn from, 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 from that space um, through the licensing CMOs such as DECAP. You had the theatrical cinema performances. And then you have where they could earn from TV, transmission, mobile phone, and online. So where it is right now is where they had seven mechanical earnings, seven rights and, and earning stream that was happening right now. It has just been eroded. Public performance, gigs, clubs, that's closed. Um, parties are no longer there. The theaters are closed. So what do we have? Public performance is now not on the table. We now have only broadcasts online and mobile um, services. So where does that put us? 50% of income is eroded. So we now look during COVID at media houses and online where this 50% is. And how do the creators now protect themselves during this time? Because as it stands, one song can have a multitude of creators. Um, Uptown Funk has almost 12 writers in that song alone. So if someone go online and have a party and plays Uptown Funk, how does those creators get paid? Those are the, the things that we know have to be looking at. Those are what the creators are now pondering. How in this space do we earn so that post-COVID we are able to at least have income to continue producing, to continue giving to the public what it is that is keeping them in this time during this pandemic, keeping even their sanity because entertainment is totally what is on the front burner right now. Gaming um, is up, Netflix stocks way up, because um, as people are shuttered indoors, what is it that they, they, they move to? Music. These sources that can help them during this time. But how, in helping you to get over this pandemic, how do you, the user, assist the creators to earn. A lot of countries have given out care packages, etc. In Jamaica, the ministry um, gave out their care package. A lot of industries were named, but the creative industry in and of itself was not named as a particular industry for um, the, 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 the earnings to be looked at in order to ensure that they are also protected or they can at least earn something during this time. So we as a CMO has, have to, and we and JCAP um, did reach out and ensure that our members were given care packages, etc. But that alone in this time and post COVID will not be able to assist the creators when 50 or 60% of their income has just been totally um, eroded. So we are now at the digital marketplace. How do they earn on YouTube, on the Spotify, etc.? Because this is also the performing rights. This is streaming. So how do you replace, try to earn from streaming as against earn from having a concert? I mean, for budget concerts, it was stated that over thousands of persons attended, right? And all creators were able to earn because we were able to collect. Um, online at this time, how do you put on a concert in order for all the songs that were, are being played? 
online to collect. According to the IFPI's Global Music 2018 report, Jamaica is regarded as a performance right market. That means that the success of our creators come through performances because users in Jamaica are willing to pay a premium to go to live concerts, right? And they are willing to pay to go to a, just a normal party where public performance is. But unfortunately, they are not willing to pay to purchase recorded music. Uh, I believe at this point in time in Jamaica, we probably only have um, less than 10 record stores that sell recorded music. So mechanical rights, which is the sale of music, a recorded music, is nil in Jamaica. We were not able to actually collect mechanical rights. So the creators have to depend again on the performance rights. And that is, how do they do it online? They can now go on YouTube, they can go on SoundCloud, and they can monetize. But again, there is a restriction there. The restriction is those channels have to have ads on it. So for the creator that is not yet popular, how does he get to earn or monetize his content on these sites, which are limited? So although you can, there is a limitation on how you can um, make er earnings on these sites. The next step that you can do online is to go to an aggregator or distributor. CD Baby is very popular. And CD Baby is able to put your music to the Deezers, the Spotify's, etc. But in doing that, it, there is still a limitation. So in our region, it comes back to public performance of music, which is the maximum for our creators, right? Internationally, the music business right now, they use streaming to measure success. But to get even a, a one US cent, 0 0.01 cent from streaming, you have to be selling over a million copies of music on these platforms. And these platforms right now are not integrated in the region because, again, the region and how we our consumption is not to buy, but, own, but to more consume what is in front of us. So we don't go out and look and try to purchase a product. What we do, we go to the public performance, the radio, et cetera, that are in front of us. So this affects how the regional music, such as reggae and dancehall, are deemed successful internationally because the services or our core audience resides in the region. So the numbers are not taken into account internationally because streaming is not yet that popular in the region. Hence, the Headline Act is massively important to our culture. Public performance, therefore, is now in venues, but how do we move from that in protecting and monetizing online public performance? The next slide that I will go to, it shows the share of music album consumption in the United States by genre. And if we can see, reggae is just 1%. So, in the international market, although reggae for us is what we, we, we live by and it, it is what we breathe and, and what it is for us, in, not only in Jamaica, but every island you travel in the Caribbean, reggae music is what you hear and it is predominant. My colleagues in the other islands normally complain to me and said, okay, during carnival, our music is played so much, but outside of carnival, all that is on the radio is reggae. Right, so our music is extremely popular in the region, but internationally, it is only it only accounts for one percent of the consumption in the United States, especially where such consumption is where we look to. So the next slide will show the challenges, and I will just speak to those challenges. 
um, that we face. Where I go back to show the uptown funk song and the, the number of artists that is there. It stands to reason, therefore, that if a DJ, which is currently happening, goes online and say, okay, I'm going to have a party and you can pay me with pull-up cash, how does that translate to having the, um, the creators getting anything from that? So yes, it is being banded about right now that music online, I mean, I, 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 I stated something to a newspaper and I was taken to task to say that I was being very insensitive in this time to state that online music should be paid for. And it went on. But the fact of the matter is, and Dr. Eklin just spoke to it, how do we balance fair use and not exploitation? How do we balance the rights and earning power of the creators with the usage by users of their content? Because the users do need to earn. How do we balance that? How do we take out of the environment and, and what is happening now, the suggestions that music and in fact copyright content should be free during a time of crisis. And yes, the creators are now online and they're giving it their all and they're they are supporting and they're singing their hearts out. And, and every, every, almost every day from all over the world, you have the creators giving a free concert. But at the end of the day, how do you do that balance? How do we balance what the creators are giving to this time in COVID-19 and helping us to keep our sanity or the, 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 the book, all the creators, to how do they earn going forward? And regulations are important. They're important in that it gives hope to the creators for them to earn economically and it enables the users to re remunerate and valid validate these works of the creators through payments. So I'm not only saying that the creators need to give and we are willing to give, but I'm also saying that the users need to come up with that fair balance. We have streaming um, platforms in the Caribbean right now you have D Music by Digicel, you have Deezer here with Flo, and you have One Spot uh, Media with RGR Group. Radio also has become very important. So how do we monetize and assist our creators through these platforms? We have to negotiate, and that we will, and that we are currently doing. But we also need the regulations and the regulatory arm of government to speak to non-exclusive because in this world, everything now you just is non-exclusive. The rights given by the creators, they want to be able to give these uh, this right to, do, to, to, to use their music so they can earn. They want to be able to give Flo the rights to be able to, con to earn because exclusivity in and of itself right now is not the norm. We have moved from the norm to a new normal. And the CMOs are here to say, okay, we will protect your rights, but we do need regulations to help us to do that in, in, in and of itself. We are here to safeguard the creators. And I just want to encourage in my parting note to our creators, continue to create, continue to give to the world, continue to be and do what you do to the best of your ability. The CMOs are here. And we will be speaking with the regulators to ensure that your rights are still protected, to ensure that um, it is pre-COVID, post-COVID, um, your rights are still there, and to ensure that what you create, you will earn economic value from it so that you can continue to create. So we give to the world, we give to Jamaica music, books, all the copyright content online, but we are also saying that we need to also monetize and earn from these works online. 
balance. That's the theme for my thing, which I'm supporting the previous speaker, Dr. Ickley. What is a fair balance? How do we achieve this fair balance? And we need to achieve this fair balance. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much, Lydia. We have heard some of the challenges there, serious issues in relation to intellectual property. And of course, the issues around music consumption, the translation of music consumption into income generation. And I'm sure these are, these are issues we are going to have to grapple with because COVID-19 isn't going anywhere. We have been told by the health authorities that this is something that's going to be around with us for some time. How we adjust is going to be really critical in terms of translating that music consumption um, and creation into um, income generation. I want to now introduce to you Mr. Yuri Peshkov. Yuri Peshkov is going to be speaking to us on vulnerability, shocks, and protecting cultural diversity in Jamaica. He is the program specialist for culture of the UNESCO Kingston Cluster Office for the Caribbean since March 2016. Yuri is involved in, in the implementation of the UNESCO culture conventions, including those protecting and safeguarding the world heritage and living heritage, prevailing illicit, preventing illicit um, trafficking of cultural properties, as well as promoting the diversity of cultural expressions. Being a focal point of the Office for Emergency Operations, he conducted a post-disaster needs assessment of culture sectors of Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica after hurricanes Irma and Maria in 2017. He participated in various U UN disaster risk reduction meetings in Asia Pacific region and contributed to preparation of, of UNESCO's crisis preparedness and response institutional framework. Mr. Peshkov is quite um, capable, therefore, of speaking to us today on vulnerability, shocks, and protecting cultural diversity in Jamaica. Uh, over to you, Yuri. Thank you very much, Sonia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and let me express my gratitude to the Institute of Caribbean Studies of UWI for inviting UNESCO to this timely forum. Uh, yesterday, 21st of May, we celebrated the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development. Uh, this is a day that celebrates uh, not only richness of the world cultures, but also the essential role that intercultural dialogue is playing for achieving peace and sustainable de development. Indeed, uh, culture offers unique opportunities to reconcile the economic and social aspects of development. Uh, cultural goods and services do have identities, reference points and values while enabling millions of creators, artists, and professionals all over the world to make a living from their work. In culturally rich and diverse Jamaica and the Caribbean, placing culture in the heart of development constitutes an essential investment in the future of a and the precondition to successful development processes that will take into account the principles of cultural diversity. Um, as stated yesterday in her message uh, devoted to the World Day for Cultural Diversity for Dialogue and Development, Minister Grange of Jamaica uh, stated that the ministry is spreading a series of cultural grants targeting Jamaicans, cultural communities, and entire creative sector. This is a very important message. Uh, as stated in the UNESCO, UNESCO's Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, and I quote, uh, creation draws on the roots of cultural tradition, but flourishes in contact with other cultures. Well, with this statement of the declaration, Jamaica and the Caribbean in this regard have a unique opportunity to blend rich cultural traditions of many nations, many people as one, and to further develop intercultural dialogue and creativity through protecting of cultural diversity. We must therefore protect 
diversity without any delay before it's too late. Uh, this is why UNESCO has launched the Resili Art Movement to find ways of fostering the protection and promotion of cultural diversity in these difficult times. By bringing together the artists, cultural professionals, governments, NGOs, uh, and the private sector to reflect together on the impact of the pandemic, the future of cultural diversity is being developed through collective intelligence in this way and joint cultural building. Uh, the present ICS forum, as well as various uh, online talks and dialogues conducted around the Caribbean, as we witness it by CARICOM, the CDB OSCS, uh, are the best actual illustrations of this resilient art movement. UNESCO, as a specialized uh, agency of the United Nations with uh, the, the, the only mandate actually in culture, creates platform for cooperation of its member states through various instruments such as normative actions or networking. And one of them we, we, we clearly know that the creative cities of uh, uh, the UNESCO creative cities and uh, Kingston and actually Port-au-Prince um, as uh, creative cities of music participating in. But also our uh, related normative actions um, to the topic includes the 1980 recommendation concerning the status of artists. Also 2001 Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity, uh, as I mentioned, one of the articles. And 2005 Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions actually being a legally binding instrument with uh, certain obligations of their state parties to be implemented. And in this regard, UNESCO support Jamaica in implementation of this 2005 convention by delivering a project on reshaping cultural policies for promotion of fundamental freedoms and the diversity of cultural expressions. That is actually designed to support Jamaica and also 16 other countries uh, globally uh, in monitoring and designing innovative policies for creative sectors through data and information collection. In this process, um, we are actually looking with the Jamaican authorities and uh, civil society to strengthen the institutional and professional capacities uh, of the involved uh, organizations and persons through the elaboration of quadrennial periodic reporting on the implementation of the 2005 convention in Jamaica. Well, since the deadline for this reporting has been moved to the mid-summer, we have an opportunity also to assess the, the, the COVID uh, you know, pandemic uh, impact to uh, implementation of the convention. Another project that we are actually launching and starting in Jamaica just now uh, under the EU UNESCO initiative for support uh, for the new regulatory frameworks to strengthen the cultural and creative industries and promote South-South cooperation. Uh, that the project that will en envisage the on-demand provision of expertise and peer-to-peer -peer learning, laying a solid groundwork for dynamic cultural and creative industries. Uh, the project will assist the development and enforcement of regulatory frameworks for the creative sector. And here in Jamaica, we are looking at elaboration of Creative Economy Act, as suggested by the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. And we also uh, consider the impact of COVID-19 crisis and post-crisis re reorganization, actually, by this project by offering tools and expertise to, to beneficiary country, in this case, Jamaica, to quickly undertake re, um, restructuring ac across and reforms. Well, now, since we are moving to the hurricane season and having pandemic situation, which is, which is, uh, yeah, which imposes uh, several challenges. Indeed, the culture of the Caribbean people is and will be affected by the impacts of climate change and now pandemics. Uh, previous years, hurricanes uh, had 
widespread impact on the region's cultural sector, including total or partial destruction of cultural assets and depositories of culture. Uh, the affected population to access and benefit from their cultural resources and services, the disruption of intangible cultural heritage practices, endangered tradition knowledge, and gone livelihoods and economic opportunities associated with the cultural industries and tourism. Well, we all know that uh, culture in general, cultural sector, is excluded from the disaster management planning and actions. And this is not, uh, I mean, this is not the uh, only reality for Jamaica and the Caribbean, but it's a, it's a general reality that we are facing. And as, uh, as mentioned by Deborah Hickling Gordon, uh, we need a balancing. We need a balancing in this sphere as well. So we need to engage the management, the disaster management planning agencies and the cultural sector in general to also plan and, uh, I mean, to move in that direction. So basically in Jamaica, uh, since 2017, right after the hurricanes of Irma and Maria, we are cooperating with PIOJ and OTPEM to conduct the trainings on post-disaster needs assessment. And uh, actually we are contributing with methodology elaborated by UNESCO on the cultural sector. In October 2018, uh, we had a specific workshop organized by PLJ uh, for culture and tourism sectors uh, with an actually practical exercise conducted in Port Royal. Well, definitely we need more of such trainings to be conducted in Jamaica and across the Caribbean uh, involving different actors of the cultural sector. Well, I have some noise outside of my window, the car is passing by, sorry. Another important activity that we, we actually launched at the end of last year and uh, have been moving forward with uh, participation of CDM and CARICOM Secretariat is related to the impact uh, of climate change and enhancing the cultural sector preparedness for ex effective response. As such, in March of this year in Barbados, we have conducted um, a regional workshop involving all the Caribbean countries, uh, member states and associate member states of CARICOM, and elaborated the guidelines for development of national strategy and plan of action for disaster resilience and recovery of the Caribbean cultural sector. So basically, I mean, with, with that, we need to add another chapter with pandemics right now that we are working on. So now we widely understand and there is a consensus uh, in the Caribbean that culture must be past, uh, part of emergency planning uh, relevant to all of the stages of the disaster management planning. I mean preparedness, response, mitigation and recovery. So there are some pilot um, follow-up activities foreseen by UNESCO to integrate culture into the national emergency planning to be conducted with CDMA and national emergency agencies. One of them will take place in Jamaica. Um, and we also hope to include the, the issues uh, faced by the first Jamaican World Heritage uh, property, the, the uh, John Crow and Blue Mountains. Yes, moving forward, I, I hope, well, I, I, I think I, I'm, <laughs> I took all, all of my time, but uh, just, just saying, you know, that moving forward, we need to really assess the COVID impact on culture. As uh, you know, in the previous uh, round of this forum, as uh, reflected by Gillian Wilkinson McDaniel from the Ministry of uh, Culture and Gender, Entertainment and Sport of Jamaica, there are some uh, developments in assessing the impacts. And we really, really you know, we, we, we have to think about, uh, and UNESCO can also share a methodology of assessing the, the losses, you know, how to assess losses from uh, not delivering the cultural uh, services. Um, I'm quite sure, you know, that we will have data after the pandemic about the losses of tourism sector, which is quite clear, but I'm not sure that we will have similar for culture. So that's where we need to, uh, you know, to, to put our resources and, uh, and uh, think forward. Uh, 
we also have a good example for uh, in Antigua uh, applying for the, the uh, International Fund for Cultural Diversity in measuring of economic contribution of cultural industries to Antigua and Barbuda national development. So these are the, the kind of projects that we would like to see more from the Caribbean. We would like to emphasize the, uh, the contribution of culture and cultural industries to the economic sectors. Finally, um, the current crisis must lead to a new awareness of uh, uh, and the new efforts to ensure the development and continuation of right cultural forms and flourishing of cultural industries in the Caribbean. And just to end, um, let me announce that next week we're going to the International Arts Education Week from 25 to 31st of May 2020. One of the contributors of this uh, forum, John Tull, uh, also you know, um, involved into this uh, movement. So I'm encouraging all of us to celebrate this week, the International Arts Education Week, and to contribute to it. So thank you very much. And sorry if I took for a bit more time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, questions of resilience, questions of sustainability, we can't get away from them. And especially for the Caribbean with islands, small island developing states, in fact, which are vulnerable to these external shocks and also um, shocks related to, to nature, natural disasters. So in a post-COVID-19 era, what are some of the things we have to grapple with? And I'm, I'm suggesting these are questions we, we can't get away from at all. So I, I, I want to remind our viewers online and via Facebook that we are celebrating 33 years of existence. This uh, series, the uh, ICS Day Forum and the Humanities in Action virtual uh, seminar series was conceptualized as a way to put uh, humanities in the forefront and also to engage with questions about reimagining Jamaica, reimagining the region beyond COVID-19. So this is in the spirit of celebration, not at all, um, you know, laying down to, 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 to play dead in a, in a time of vulnerability, but rather to lift ourselves up and as the wailing souls uh, we started last week with those, those words, Jaja give us life to live and so let us live. We are going to live and live well in order to consider our existence into the 22nd century as I like to talk about. Our next speaker, of course, is Ms. Olainka jacobs Bonick. She's going to be speaking about the status of the artist in COVID-19 times. She's an expert in cultural strategy cultural administration and creative and cultural enterprise development. With a background of over 20 years working in the cultural and creative enterprise development sector, she's a founder of the South South Collective, a nonprofit art and culture collaboration platform which connects creative and cultural practitioners across the 134 countries of the global South through business to business opportunities and into international convenings such as the Thrive Conversation Series, International Creative Exchange Caribbean, and the Creative Enterprise Challenge. Olainka has quite a lot on her plate. I actually don't know when she sleeps. She has worked extensively in the Caribbean and internationally in creative and cultural industries, enterprise development, including for the government of Jamaica, the government of Barbados, the British government, Car CARICOM, the EU and, and the ACP, as well as for UNESCO on the, uh, and on projects funded by DFID, Caribbean Development Bank and the World Bank. So Ola Inka, speaking to us on the status of the artist in COVID-19 times, over to you, Ola Inka. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sonia, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. Uh, in this forum, which is very welcome at this time and so important. Um, it's been interesting listening to the, the previous presenters uh, because what I am going to share today, I feel, uh, underscores why we have the challenges that we do. And perhaps we have not considered um, the root of the challenges, because we are 
far more concerned with uh, putting out the fires. So I would like to share a presentation with you now, um, where we will, I will look at uh, the overview of the status of the artist. and how that status can contribute to um, what is happening in COVID-19 right now. So if we could please bring up the presentation on the screen, that would... Okay, I can't see it. Oh, but I can't, I can't see it at all. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> so an overview of socio-professional socio conditions of the artist and the relevance of the status of the artist in the current global context. So um, as we move on through the presentation to the next slide, um, you heard my colleague uh, Yuri speak about the 1980 recommendation concerning status of the artist. Um, I wanted to start out with this because I feel that is, it is very, very important that we are aware as uh, individuals and professionals in the creative and cultural sector that this recommendation actually exists. Um, many of us who are in decision-making positions, uh, who are advocating on behalf of the sector, are not aware of the conventions that are in place, the ones that were mentioned by Yuri, and what they contain. So this particular recommendation concerning the status of the artist uh, was is a part of the 2005 convention, um, UNESCO Convention of Cultural Diversity, and it calls upon member states to improve the professional and economic status of artists through the implementation of policies and measures related to social security, income, and working conditions, among other things. It is non-binding, but it does remain uh, the principal standard setting instrument specifically related to the status of the artist. Um, within the convention itself, there are several, um, uh, there are several um, articles that relate to the status of the artist. The convention is binding and it has been signed by all of the member states, including our countries in the Caribbean. Um, the this, uh, status of the artist also uh, calls on member states to acknowledge the rights of workers to be considered, the rights of artists, sorry, to be considered as cultural workers and consequently benefit from all of the legal, social and economic advantages pertaining to the status of workers. So it, since 1980, we have been discussing the lack of socio-professional um, advantages as relates to workers in the arts and cultural industries. And we are, as Dr. Hickling said, still very much there. Um, if we move on to the next slide, I would just like to uh, highlight, these are some of the, this is a summary of the recommendation and I would encourage you to familiarize yourself with it. But I wanted to highlight the fact that member states are supposed to recognize the essential role of art in the life and development of individuals in society um, and to defend and assist artists in all of their endeavors. So it sounds quite lofty, it sounds quite idealistic, but the truth is that if we are not aware of what our member states have actually signed to, then we are unable to utilize it as a tool in our advocacy. So in listening to colleague from JCAP, um, you know, listening to Deborah, it is so important that we are able to, to hold our um, organizations, the ones that create policies to account, but holding them to account in a way that, that is recognizable for them. Um, and they recognize the status of the artist. Um, so as we move on to the next, in the next slide, we will be able to also see, um, I wanted to highlight why it matters. So the general purpose of the status of the artist law uh, is to define who is an artist, to regularize their status as a professional, and to acknowledge the atypical way in which their work, 
Now, why is this important? This is important because if you don't have a legal status within your constitution or within your policy frameworks, you do not exist. So if our member states uh, have signed this 2005 convention and in our, are in agreement with the recommendation of the status of the artist, then they are compelled to ensure that laws and policies are in place to acknowledge uh, the way that artists work and also to ensure that they have the same socio-professional um, professional privileges as other workers, dentists, lawyers, doctors doctors, teachers, nurses. So this does exist and we need to use it to our advantage. Um, here in this very uh, simple diagram, I'm demonstrating why the artist is more than a creator, but they are actually an economic center. The artist themselves uh, and the work that they produce engenders job creation for a number of other participants in the ecosystem. The producer, the manager, the cultural worker, and of course the retail outlets would have nothing to do if we did not have artists producing. Um, and I think it has been spoken to before by our colleague from JCAP to say that, uh, you know, the process comes before the product. Artists think, think in process and the, ind the individuals, the, the members of the ecosystem and the smaller bubbles, they think in terms of product, but they have no product without the artist going through their process. This is why the status of the artist is incredibly important. It recognizes, as I say here, the atypical way in which they work, which would include recognizing the process that comes before the product and being able to implement or be able to request funding and support and also have policies that protect the process part of of the creation value chain. So as we'll see in the, in the slide that's uh, coming up next, I wanted to take you on a brief history of the value of arts and culture through the ages. Now, Dr. Hickling spoke to the fact that we are stuck in the 1980s. I would like to suggest to you that we are actually stuck much further back in medieval times, and this is this is uh, how I'm going to explain that to you. Uh, the value of arts and culture, as you know, is always created within context. The thing about value is that we don't get a chance to determine it. Someone else does, as the creators and the parts of the ecosystem that work in the creative and cultural industries. We get to determine the price, but not the value. And we have had a very difficult time in reconciling value and income because what we think is value is not what people are willing to pay for. So I wanted to take you back to the 13th and the 15th century um, where artistic value more or less began, so to speak. As a matter of fact, this, this concept of artistic value goes as far back as Plato and Aristotle, but I didn't want to go back that far because I didn't think it was as, as relevant. Um, during the 13th and 15th centuries, when the artisan became the artist, this was the tipping point in the value of arts and culture. Um, the churches were all powerful. They needed a way to communicate with their um, patrons who were mostly illiterate serfs in Europe. And so they recognized the value of images to be able to communicate and thereby dominate and indoctrinate um, their congregants. This is uh, when we saw the beginning of illuminers here. Um, these are the, as you can see on the sc screen, um, very highly detailed, often using gold leaf images that were used to describe passages in the Bible that were um, important for uh, the governance of the church in terms of how, how um, they worked. If we can go into the next slide, please. Now, that was, uh, that was succeeded by patronage um, in Renaissance uh, Europe, 14th and 17th centuries. Now, this is particularly interesting because if you take a minute to just look at the very first point there, it says patronage functioned as proof of 
status and power that could serve purposes of propaganda and entertainment. Conversely, essential contacts were essential to an artist's well-being. I would like to put forward that not much has changed. Not much has changed in terms of our approach and our view of what uh, the value of arts and culture are and that what the status of the artist is, as a matter of fact, and how we view and how we interface with artists and what they produce. Um, we are still very much in this European uh, Renaissance patronage approach to what our artists are producing and the value of their work. Next, could we please move on to the next slide because I have actually run out of time and I want to get through this as quickly as possible. Um, so in the 17th century, when you know the, the, the humanist movement was, was looming in, the, in, the, in, in Europe and the artists were starting to speak up for themselves, um, that is when, of course, we had the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. So we have the core of African artistic expression, which is, is around imagery, geometric patterns, and, and in reality, African art is a cultural object with a purpose. And as we'll see in the next slide, what this has created, I believe, is a clash of the titans. So um, as, the, as the European Renaissance was, was uh, winding down and during that period, um, European artists, in order to assert themselves, made the proclamation that their, that their uh, creativity and their talent was divine. As a matter of fact, Michelangelo was referred to as Il Divino, and he was one of the main Renaissance painters. So here we have a clash of the, of the divine with the utilitarian, and in the middle we have the status of the artist squash. Now, this is quite particular to the countries in the global south that have been colonized, um, because we've all, been, we've all inherited uh, this um, divine this concept that artist has is divine we've inherited it through through um through colonization and slavery in our case and then of course we bring our own um elements into the mix uh in that with our artist our african artistic heritage we know that um our art is utilitarian so as we go to the next slide please we will see how this can create some form of tension so We've come from the medieval ages down into the modern age, and here you will see three um, societal ages that have characterized the value of arts and culture in the last 150 years. We are squarely in the conceptual age, an age of convergence, of creativity, of a strong and commercially supported aesthetic. Um, however, I would like to advance that our the prism through through which we are viewing and actually supporting our artists in this conceptual age is very much stuck in the Middle Ages. So as we'll see in the, in the slide that comes up, um, here, this is where we are now. So this was a report that was commissioned by UNESCO uh, in 2018, looking at the working conditions of artists across the globe and how they are actually, how countries are actually implementing the status of the artist recommendation. Um, I will say here that uh, there was a survey, a global survey that was done with all member countries. Um, only two countries in the Caribbean actually completed the survey. Um, the uptake across the globe was not huge, so it's not something that's specific to the Caribbean. It is really uh, a global issue. Um, but yes, only two countries, Trinidad and Cuba, in this report, uh, Jamaica does get mentioned uh, in terms of the uh, cultural policy and states of the artist um, focus within that. Uh, but it is still very much an issue that we have to address if we are going to move beyond where we are now. And COVID has really given us a, a, a huge opportunity for visibility that we have never had before as a sector. And I would like to say that we must use this visibility in a way that will help advance the status of the artist and really give us the type of policy instrument and um, direction that we need to, to ensure that our, our artists are treated as professionals. Um, in the next couple of slides, we can just go to the next slide very quickly, please. Um, again, here, this is, I'm just speaking about the fact that we are rooted uh, we are still deeply rooted in the medieval traditions of Renaissance European art patronage. 
Um, but critically, the global techno-economic and socio-cultural arrangements that have governed us and our perception of the artist and their status to date have now reached their functional limits with COVID-19. So this is the point, our tipping point, at which we can now advance the status of the artist agenda in a way that we have never done before. Um, we're coming close to the end, so if you please go to the next slide. Yes, so what are the tasks that lay ahead of us? Um, primarily, three. We need to decolonize our view of the artist because we are still very much viewing it, as I said, through the prism of what was inherited through colonization and slavery. We need to organize. It has been said more than once in this today and in the previous forum. We do have organizations like JCAP, but we need more. And we need to be very strategic about how we approach the organization. And we also need more organizations at a regional level. Um, and we also need to advocate, but to advocate not on a one-on-one -on -one basis, to advocate collaboratively. Um, this is one of the things that, that we are doing in silos. We are not advocating as a sector, but we're advocating as industries. That is what was the, the case before COVID. We are now stronger together and we need to bring together um, our collective strengths to create opportunities for our artists. Um, and this is uh, the May, May Status of the Artist Month is something that I, uh, with my colleagues in the South South Collective, decided we were going to do. Um, it's still May, so we can still advocate for it. Uh, could we please move on to the upcoming slide, which should be the final one? Right, and so that's all. I'm sorry for taking um, a few minutes over my time, uh, but I, I really wanted to drive home the fact that although we are we are working in the conceptual age, our artists are working in the conceptual age, we're very much there, um, the view of, of the status of the artist and who the artist is and what they represent in society and how they are treated is still very much rooted in, in a colonial, in a neo-colonial, post-colonial and um, also, um, you know, a neoliberal and uh, capitalist economic view um, that we need to remedy before we can actually lay the foundation uh, to get to where we need to be as a sector. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ola Inka. As a region living in and through the arts as lifeblood for many creatives, we can't get away from the serious question around the status of the artist. And that status, that word status, it, it brings to mind so many issues, whether it is the perceptions around class, the perceptions around the work, the value of the work, and so on. We have many issues to be able to contend with. So let me move now to Dr. Dennis Howard, who is going to be giving us some tips. Tips for creatives during the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Howard is an adjunct lecturer in music business management in the creative industries at the Institute of Caribbean Studies. He is a Grammy-nominated music producer, and he holds a PhD in cultural studies from the University of the West Indies. He's the author of Ranting, Inside the Dance Hall, and Creative Echo Chamber, Contemporary Music Production in Kingston, Jamaica. He's a managing director of the Institute of Cultural Policy and Innovation, and works as a business development consultant for several creative enterprises, including Denroy, Denroy Morgan Music, Dance Hall Hostel and Tropic House Music Incorporated. He's currently working on his new book on Jamaican music genres. Dennis Howard, we're pleased to have you with us. Please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, we're just going to look at some of the things. Very interesting conversation so far. And uh, what I'm going to say is going to be appealing into what uh, uh, I see as some critical steps for creatives to take during the COVID-19. And the first one, I believe, a lot of times we don't get that chance as creatives, producers, songwriters, musicians, dancers, we don't get a chance to really hone and, and improve your craft. And I think this downtime presents a great opportunity for us to, to do that. So as a songwriter, Dean Fraser said recently on, on another webinar that 
what we should be doing now is to at least write one great song. So there's always room for improvement in terms of songwriting, in terms of as a musician, your instrument, as a, as a writer, you can improve that. Dancing, you stay wherever and, and rehearse constantly as a painter or even as a music producer. So it is critical for us to use this time and, and improve what we do. Um, we, we clearly understand the, the, the era that we are in now, and it's now digitization, it's now digital. And as creatives, it is not enough for us to have intermediaries who will deal with the, the digitization process. And so improving your digital skills is critical. As I have up there, measuring is good even for creatives. And having digital skills will certainly improve your, your, your opportunities and chances to measure what you're doing. Video conferencing, we need to know how to operate in that uh, uh, environment. We see the, 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 the constraints sometimes when creatives try, like in the clash between Babyface and Teddy Riley, uh, there were some issues there because of not understanding the, the technology. Utility tools that we take for granted in terms of Microsoft Office, we should know that a lot of people, especially uh, people who are averse to technology. They don't understand how to use Microsoft Office. They don't know about publisher. They don't know about access. And very few people understand in the, in the, in the business how to use Excel. Yet, in terms of reading spreadsheets, in terms of reading information coming from the intellectual property office, that's the format that sometimes it comes in. The, the fact of, of having a, a computer and knowing how to operate a PC versus a Mac. It's, it's, it's it gone are the days when you will say that, listen, I'm a Mac person and I hate PC or vice versa. There are, there are sometimes uh, situations where you have to function using the book, whichever one available. And the mobile phone is one of the most important instrument going forward. Most people and creatives who understand the use of the mobile phone it is a center for creativity. You can make music, you can take photographs, you can edit, you can, and I'm talking about video editing, you can do graphics, you can do almost everything on your mobile phone. And a lot of people, in fact, I know a lot of creatives who don't have a smartphone, and I always implore them to get one. Emails, emails are important in terms of marketing, outreach because it's simple and it might sound weird that a lot of people don't understand how to use an email but a lot of creatives don't and of course social media social media there are many platforms you must be adept at working and understanding and using the, the methodologies how to make social media be effective for you and I said as I said earlier measuring is good even for creatives. Data analytics on Facebook, social media, even your email, you need to know, you need to do what we call listening. And analytics will allow you to listen. What works? What song work? What image will work? What video will work? And so understanding these issues and analytics is everywhere. Google, uh, all the social media platforms, you will get that kind of information. And you, there's, there's uh, Monk, Monk, the, 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 the research software, I think it's called Monkey, I don't remember the first name. Uh, they, 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 you, you can utilize all of these areas. And I, th I think while we talk about, and Dr. Eklin spoke about the balance, and I always advocate financial literacy. Most creatives are not millionaires and will never be. And so sometimes what we do, we look at the, 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 the upper echelons of, 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 of the creative industries and, and speak about all of these millionaires and billionaires. 
But for the most part, a lot of our creatives will be uh, journeymen in some instances and just earn enough money to, to take them uh, throughout their career. So it's very important to be financially literate because a lot of our creatives make a lot of money and they end up broke. Budget, as simple as that. What is a budget? Understanding what is a budget. What is the difference between revenue and expenditure? Investment versus consumption. We see that in, especially in the music industry and filmmaking industry, uh, consumption and conspicuous consumption, fancy cars, hot clothes, uh, the, 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 the chic lifestyle, the rich lifestyle is part and parcel of the, the, the industry. But it, uh, consuming and living the life that your, your, your avatar or your, your personality lives is, one, is a different thing. Because if you just spend, spend, spend at the end of the day without any kind of investment, without any kind of savings, uh, you'll end up broke. The importance of a, a, a thing called compound interest, knowing statements like a profit and loss statement, cash flow statement. You don't have to be an expert. You just need to understand it. And a very important thing, debt. A lot of people are indebted. And that is the foundation of their, their uh, demise in terms of their success financially. I am one of those who advocate that your brand must be a business. And it can't be that as a creative, you are not in control of your business. To get people to do your business is a prescription for all kinds of negative things to happen to you. So you should understand it. I don't need, you don't need to be an expert. You need to understand issues of what is the difference between a partnership, a sole proprietor, what is a limited liability, why it is important to, to have a limited liability. What is a company structure? How do you uh, structure your company? And also intellectual property, which uh, Ms. Rose just spoke about, your company trademark and other intellectual property issues. And Debbie spoke about the, 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 the balance. And while we are saying that you must develop some kind of business acumen, we also, as Liz Ryan said, the future of work is human. And so there has to be that balance. And so you have to look at your fans as your customers. You have to look at your branding, what is negative branding, what is positive branding. What is your product, whatever that product is? How do you develop that product? What is the life cycle of that product? How do you reinvent yourself? And how do you protect your intellectual property? Copyright is one, trademark is one, and in some instances you might even have patents. And with the, the, the digital uh, progression that is happening now, you will have, uh, have to copyright uh, digital applications and all of that. And as we spoke earlier, we spoke about the, the statements of uh, profit and loss and all of that. It is important for you to look at your financials. It is important to look at your human resources. Who is your gopher? Who is your valet? Who is your engineer? Who is your driver? Who is your road manager? And you have to deal with them in a very business-like manner or else you'll have a good team. And because it's not a business framework, it's not going to last. And we see a lot of artists and creatives build great teams and they disintegrate because it was not done in a, in a, in a business-like fashion. Let's move on. Marketing. During this period, learn and improve your marketing skills. Let your creative juices flourish. Marketing is one of the highly creative things. And it's time for us as creatives, especially in the Caribbean, to cater 
firstly to our market and also to reach out to the international marketplace. And we can't do it with cookie cutter uh, solutions that we get on the internet or, or from these uh, powerful people who talk about marketing uh, in seminars and webinars. We must, at this point, look at what we want to project as an artist and as a creative. Content is king. What kind of content are you going to present? What, what it, does it represent? It, you, it, gone are the days when you wake up and you uh, post on Facebook or Instagram that you woke up, or you're petting your dog, or your uh, fans might, some fans might be interested in that, but at, after a while that becomes uh, problematic. And so it is important to decide what content, what brand, what imaging are you going to, to, to project and what your, your fans are interested in. So you have to listen. You test, you listen, and then you continue along that track. Word of mouth is important. And so uh, we take it for granted, but word of mouth is, gone, is now gone electronic. So it is very important to create brands, create content that will uh, expand your, 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 your horizon in terms of your popularity and your fan base and, your, and develop super fans. Earned media, that's freeness, publicity. So you have to connect with the media houses, have a relationship with them and, and get into the, those spaces. And of course, this is the favorite of Jamaican creative stunts. But a lot of the stunts are very negative. And so we have to get become very creative in, in the way we uh, do stunts. It's, it's, it's very effective, but sometimes you can end up with negative brand, 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 brand results. And of course, physical and mental hygiene. It is very important, especially in the COVID-19, to understand that the power of the body and the mind is where we get our creativity from. So physical training is a must. Eating, eating healthy is a must. Try meditating. There are apps that can assist you in terms of meditation. They, and all of this, what we're trying to project and give you as tips, it does, none of it really needs any kind of money during the, the, the period because a lot of information is accessible on the internet. Learn how to relax, sleep more, and a very important one, talk to someone because our mental health, and it's fine to be anxious now, it is fine to be scared, it is, fri it is it's fine to be, to be, to be frightened, but it's also good to be happy, and it's also good to be relaxed. Come get into your feelings in terms of, of, of what is happening now. If you feel like you want to be scared, be scared. If you want to, if at, at some point in the day you're very happy, be very happy. But, also, but make sure that you take care of the mental part of it, because without the mental and the physical uh, part of it, it, your creative juices, honing your craft, will not be as effective as it should. And so finally, I would implore our creatives to use the time and improve all of this, and improve all of the areas that I have suggested. And I think one of the critical, two of the most outstanding one for me is the physical and mental hygiene and also owning that craft, improving that craft. You can always get better. Try to do a better song than the great hit song that you did. Try to choreograph a better dance routine than you did before. Paint a better picture. Paint, uh, write a better poem. And once we are in post-COVID, you'd be a better creative, understanding where you want to go and what should be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, some great tips there for our creatives, for our industry players. 
key tips and even in relation to just improving the kind of intellectual property that you have out there to be able to earn from in the context of a collection, collective rights management organization like JCAP. So here we are. If you are just joining us, you have joined the second part of the ICS Day Forum as part of the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series. We're joining you because we want to talk about building a resilient, creative future beyond COVID-19. We're bringing you perspectives from the Caribbean and beyond. And of course, in the context of this uh, ICS Day Forum, we're celebrating 33 years of existence, contribution to policy, contribution to advocacy, contribution to cultural pedagogy in the context of the Institute of Caribbean Studies. You can follow us online. Follow the ICS Mona online via Instagram, via Twitter. We're there to take your questions and, and to answer you and to share with you some of the key events that we have from time to time. I'm going to move now to our last speaker, last but not least, Dr. Joanne Tull is going to be speaking to us about building a resilient Caribbean festival economy. We heard from Lydia's presentation earlier that performance is key. And where are we performing? Quite naturally in the Caribbean, we have a lot of live events. We're known for festivals. We're known for carnivals. Dr. Joanne Tull is, is, is an academic researcher and consultant in Caribbean creative economy development with particular interest in the festival economy, cultural industries development impacts and creative entrepreneurship and strategy. She has written and published mainly in the area of festival or event evaluation. She has conducted several commission studies on festival impacts, the more recent including Carifesta, Tobago Blue Food Festival and Tobago Jazz and, and, as, and as well the Trinidad Carnival. Dr. Tola served as an advisor on various regional projects and programs with, for example, the Caribbean Development Bank, the Organization of American States, and CARICOM. She has also served as strategic advisor and the strategic planner for various projects for Caribbean creative entrepreneurs and cultural enterprises. She is currently the academic coordinator of the Carnival Studies Program, as well as a postgraduate diploma in arts cultural and enterprise management at the St. Augustine campus of the UWI. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Joanne Tull. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much for that introduction, Dr. Naya. And thank you very much for having me here this morning with you this afternoon. And I want to begin first by making a very interesting observation. That as we contemplate the matter of resilience for the region's festival economy, urged now upon us by this COVID situation, our current reality really extends to a broader scenario where the global creative and cultural economy has long moved definitively ahead where, as I said last week in a, a class online, from bricks to clicks and from marketplace to market space, and with the Caribbean continuing to play catch up. Now, I have argued elsewhere that the absence of an appropriate framework that can guide efficient use of our indigenous cultural resources precludes us from establishing process, applying process, and and encouraging a commitment to process in consistent and sustainable measure. And for me, that consistency and sustainability should relate to global competitiveness and at the same time, domestic regional growth as an outgoing outcome. And like my colleagues before, I would give reference again to Dr. Hickland's comment about balance, because this is another aspect of balance that we really should be striving for. And so where are we now amidst a global um, pandemic that has cataclysmically halted that normal in the region, as you see I showed in the, the first slide, where physical contact lies at the heart of the, our Caribbean festival economy's enterprise and operation. And not, of course, to be overlooked are the number and range of socioeconomic opportunities that are derived 
from the festival, such as community engagement, community building and employment, as and of course, micro enterprise development and so on. Now, if truth be told, one might say that the pandemic has sharply brought the for brought to the forefront this long-standing deficiency of a guiding framework for our futures, um, particularly in this segment of our economy. Um, in a sense, COVID-19 has brought the heat on for us to act responsibly and in forward-thinking ways for a sustainable future. And so, having been asked to make a contribution here, again, I have to thank ICS for this because it got me to thinking about what do the members of that sector think about the now? And, and most importantly, what are they thinking about um, in terms of those futures? And so we have a survey in circulation right now that gives us some preliminary findings that interestingly support some of what I have not too long mentioned and, and indeed some of what my colleagues have mentioned in their previous presentations. What I want to flag before I get into three key pieces of that data so far is that most of the respondents so far uh, to the survey operate in the carnival sector. Now, this is not to say that we don't have persons operating within other aspects of, of festival economy still, such as heritage and jazz festivals and community-based festivals. But particularly with respect to heritage and community-based, um, one would find that sometimes they are hesitant to engage with the digital environment because so much of what they did had much to do with a showcasing and a performance of something quite tangible. And of course, seeing their respective stakeholders and patrons and audience right there before them. The other interesting thing about this survey for me, in terms of profiling those who've answered, is that 74% of the respondents really represent or can be characterized as micro enterprises. Um, most of them either self-employed, which is reflective by the one that you see there, or not having more than 10 employees. And this, of course, to my mind, begs the question as the extent to which whatever the micro enterprise strategies are being planned right now across the region encapsulate this particular sector. Now, I want to give about three pieces of, of, of key data that might be considered um, not surprising. But at the same time, I believe it's important to flag it because I want to give the, fl the flip side to the, to the bad news, of course. And the first is that you would see there that most um, respondents to this survey, almost 60 percent, have said that they've not been able to refocus their business since and during this time of, of COVID. Now, this is where the presentation by our colleague, Dr. Howard, just now um, becomes very critical. Not just simply because some may have challenges with the digital environment, but certainly with respect to his last two slides or so, um, there is a particular um, need for the creative to engage in an exercise of, of, of um, mental um, re refurbishment, replenishment, for, for, for want of a better term, that would certainly encourage them to, to positively push forward. And I know that that is not a simple thing, but certainly um, if one has not been engaging in such before, certainly a situation such as this that would cause high level, levels of stress would make it even more difficult. The other point or interesting thing about the data is one can identify what are considered um, this range between worse impact and what is considered um, um, a positive impact. And as you can see inside of the data there, um, networking and collaborations, um, whilst on one hand worse impact 17.1, it's interesting to see that there are those who are still trying to, of course, collaborate and engage during this downtime. One would also notice that business planning and strategic planning does have a notable score. But as we would well imagine, for many aspects of business, worse impact would have garnered 
the significant uh, amount of, of rating of a zero. And of course, gigs and sales, as you see, they're standing out at 67.2%. Not surprisingly, therefore, one would imagine that when asked the question about the need for support and assistance, um, one would see that short-term capital was one of the high suggestions, as well as training and retooling. And behind that coming and a delay in bills and other such expenses, if necessary. And so for me, it brings me to ask the question and, of course, to try to explore um, through this opportunity to share with you what then are possibly some of these initiatives that can be pursued during this time of, of rebuilding and, and certainly, as the Trinidadians would like to say, of holding it down. Because after all, uh, you want to um, imagine that through coming through the pandemic that you would still have business, you will still have an enterprise that you can continue forward. Indeed, in following up discussions based on the preliminary data, there are one or two persons who are contemplating coming out of the sector. But I must say, so far, that seems to be a very small percentage. Overall, there seems to be a positive sense about what lies ahead and the opportunities that are ahead. I, the challenge seems to be, what do we do now at this time to be some kind of financially or economically sustainable. And so if you recall the slide before, where the question was asked, have you been able to refocus your business activities? That slightly lesser percentage that said yes, scoring about 40%, would have identified these areas on the other side of your screen as the ways in which they have been trying to either maintain or to rebuild within the Caribbean festival economy. And there are many more because there are 119. But what I have done is I've pulled the top ones. These are the ones that repeatedly came up. Change format for business, online marketing, enhancing systems. Some are bunkering down with the staff and engaging in training. Some are getting into more virtual engagement merchandising, and so on. Of course, because digital engagement was one that was repeatedly um, mentioned, it would be useful for us to have a look at how exactly the sector has been using the digital environment, particularly since I've already made the contention that prior to COVID, this has been a physical um, contact kind of engagement where business operation and enterprise is concerned. I mean, you go to a festival. Um, I can't imagine playing masks six feet apart, but who knows? We've already seen the mask enter the, the masquerade, but it's not something that is overwhelmingly light. That too, I have polled. And so far, um, out of that small poll, at least 80% of persons have indicated they really don't like a mask. They prefer it just because, of course, to be safe. So in looking at the issue of how are you using the digital environment, it is interesting to note that whilst there is that percentage there that says that they're not using it at all, you are seeing that persons are indicating that they're streaming live content, particularly through social media, as well as recording and uploading content. And so I want to give two examples of that. Um, paying slight homage to my host, ICS. You see there on one side of your screen, one of the popular masquerade bands coming out of Jamaica, Jamaica. And this um, beach party, just to give a very quick context before I go on, is one of their climax events after being on the road this, this Sunday. Very, very popular. And it's one where there is where you see the dance hall and the soca meet. Um, because, for example, last year, the headline act there was Bounty Killer. But as you can see here from this flyer, this event happened this year on the IG Live. You would also notice that all of the sponsors are at the bottom. So this is an interesting transition where, whilst the festival organizer has had has had to come out of the physical milieu 
coming into the virtual life context, the sponsors, some of the business support mechanisms have come along. Now I recognize and I am aware of the dynamics in terms of the Jamaica Carnival context, but we are seeing some of that also here in Trinidad and Tobago, which I will show shortly. On the other side is a very popular DJ. He is Panamanian, but he has embraced the Caribbean culture. It took many of us a while to recognize and realize that Rigo is Panamanian. Nevertheless, he has continued to push his craft as a DJ. You will notice this is a Juve party. And as we know about Juve, this is something, again, outdoors, physical engagement, um, done in, in paint and mud and oil and what have you. Yet here is a live where you are being encouraged to simulate the same, of course, in your living room. One of the interesting things to note about this DJ is that he quickly moved into having on his platform um, the call um, to his audience and his, his, um, his patrons in his life to send, as he called it, contributions to his cash app, his Zelle, or his PayPal. So that brings me then to the question of how is money being made? I did ask the question because there is a sense that whilst nothing is going on out there physically, that fearfully we may not have streams or persons may not be trying to find ways to generate revenue within this particular segment of the Caribbean cultural and creative economy. And I am stressing this particular segment because as has been indicated by Dr. Hickland very early on, and even from our colleague Olienka, the artist in many aspects is and has become severely marginalized economically, financially, and otherwise on account of this pandemic. Notwithstanding, I felt it useful for our pondering on the question of resilience to hear how stakeholders within this sector are trying to generate some kind of income stream or pursue an income stream during this time. And this slide is particular to during this time. And these were the top six. Some are engaging in product service diversification, some have gone into consultancy training. They may have had those opportunities before and they're pursuing them even more. Digital sales and revenue, fundraising. I have not yet had opportunity to talk to those about the fundraising as to what exactly are they doing in this particular context to do so. Merchandising, which we also are seeing reflected in the Versa series, like for example, with Erica Badu, and Jill Scott, right at the bottom, was the call to respond to go and click and purchase merchandise. So for some within the Caribbean, merchandise is selling within the festival economy context. And then sponsorship, which as we saw with the Jamaica um, flyer before, some of the sponsors have continued to hold on to their business partners in the festival economy because they see them to have these captive audiences that this, they still want to be in tune with. So I give an example of such here. Um, voice, our many times so-called monarch, and if I may put a plug for DCFA, DCFA students, humanities students of the University of the West Indies. And as you see from the middle um, bar, the media reporter indicates voice raises the bar on virtual concerts with niceness. I look at a lot of these, um, and I would tell you that so far to date, of those I have seen, this is perhaps the most organized, most well-produced online concert that I have seen. One will notice on one side of your screen there, you are seeing the artist on stage. So there was a stage built. And one can also see on the other side of your screen there, there were sponsors involved. I don't know. Yes, you can see the number. So 5,526 people at one point in time were in this live watching this event. And on the other hand, 
you will see a slight dip. Well, that dip is because that's when the concert ended and people were inside the chat saying, wait, it really finished? We want more, we want more. Now, my understanding in having discussions with some of the sponsors is that the artists are being compensated in some way. And so this now, utilizing your web space, has become one of the ways in which income is being generated by the, the in within that carnival subsector um, context. So that brings me to contemplate before I close, just to mention um, what I think is key. If you notice, I've I've put back up my point about um, um, this piece, the praxis. Um, and you would notice, which I will address now, I have some stars, I have a question mark, and I have some building, building tools. And to be honest, this is where we fall short. That question mark for praxis is one of the reasons we find ourselves having to do exactly what we're doing today. The need to articulate, and, and even when we had our meeting this week um, with the CARICOM Secretariat, which is very needed and very useful, um, the need to contemplate that future. I, I want to say it's because we continue to lack praxis. For me, praxis is about process and an engagement of some kind of philosophical um, um, underpinning. And we heard our colleague um, make mention, as well as Yuri, about the UNESCO Convention. These are some of the places in which we can start to help us to build that practice. Praxis, sorry. I dare say that if we look to our creatives within this particular sector, um, where their, their livelihood is concerned, we would also get some philosophical um, pointers as to what that might mean. And that has to be tied to purpose. In this instance, purpose being strategy. Purpose in this regard for me, I see as a continual um, building situation because whilst on the one hand, as we see from the data, those within the sector are strategizing and trying to pursue strategies, we know that we operate in a context where at the macro level, at the level of governance, strategy for this subsector is quite weak. And therefore, no surprise in the absence of practices or policy mechanisms, therefore, continue to lag and really are not in a position to lead or propel the sector forward at a time like this. I dare say pedagogy and practice which we've always been good at, may have to be the context to lead us forward in contemplating, not just contemplating now, but as Deborah said, acting out, doing, doing resilience. I think COVID has brought for us an opportunity now to do resilience, not, not plan it any further, do resilience. And in that regard, these really, for me, coming out of the survey with the sector, and aligning with my thoughts in terms of what futures mean for the Caribbean festival landscape. I see praxis always has to be there to inform what we're doing ahead, but certainly monetization strategies, very critical. I believe based on the slide before, we got some examples, but certainly brand development in terms of selling your brand online. Um, Product export, if you can, whilst our borders are closed to physical movement, products still can move around. Um, web space, as Voice did, and other artists are doing, selling, advertising. And most, most importantly, which I think we forget, and very relevant to those who are operating within the community-based festivals and heritage festivals, selling your cultural ad. Everybody has a story. I call it the culture ad. And that idea of that story is always of relevance to someone somewhere. It is out of that stories can be told and can be packaged and can be offered on the global market. Um, cultural art generates photos, maybe of use relevance to UNESCO, for example, to National Geographic, these kinds of organizations. And of course, they can be used for um, developing training platforms. And then last but not least for me, measuring is very critical. Because if we don't measure now, 
it will be very difficult to have an understanding of whether or not what is being planning, what is being planned, and what we are insisting on doing will make that difference comparatively when we do find ourselves um, coming out gradually out of this particular current um, scenario of lockdown. Thank you very much, and it was a pleasure being here with you. I look forward to the questions and the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Tull. Um, that was very stimulating. We particularly like the fact that the live survey um, results were very much a part of your presentation. We, we, we are taking questions now. We want to remind the audience that we can receive your questions um, via UWI TV um, and certainly on Facebook as well. And while we, 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 we wait to get some of your questions, I want to remind us that this moment is about contemplating different strategies for resilience and certainly building the domestic market in, 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 in the various ways throughout the disciplines in terms of the cultural and creative industries. We're, we are definitely interested in growth. Um, we, we want to encourage growth. We want to encourage strategies for monetizing. And we certainly want to develop on those strategies. So let me pose one of the questions we have now received from the UWI TV website. And this is for Joanne. With the cancellation of live events and touring, including for mega festivals and carnivals across the globe, how will the Caribbean festival economy really survive? If you look at the, 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 the rest of the globe in terms of festivals, you are seeing cancellations to 2021, in some cases 2022. How will the Caribbean festival, what projections can we make for the survival of the Caribbean festival economy? Right. Thank you very much for the question. At this particular point in time, I think it, it, it is very much um, reliant on some of the initiatives that we are seeing um, those in the sector um, trying to do. It is to be remembered that we have never been in a scenario such as this. And I often say to people, a prediction, a definitive prediction is very difficult to give. However, we can watch at ongoing trends. And based on what I've seen so far, what I believe will happen is that we will return to a place where our domestic markets are going to be very critical. So there is a slide that I, I did not remember to put in, but I can make mention of it. Just this week, Newsday um, um, posted online a map of the Caribbean showing um, our progress in terms of recovery. And as you know, basically across the Caribbean, with the exception of Haiti, um, we are not doing too bad comparatively to the rest of the world. And so, for example, I contemplate the future where, in the first instance, you may very well have regional carnival, literally. You will have a case where you will need to engage with your local markets more and perhaps getting to what we would call local festival tourism. And so the future in the first instance, if we can look at phases just as we have to do in terms of coming out of lockdown, you may very well be looking at a place where sus sustainability for the time will have to rely on your local market and by extension, your, your domestic regional markets. Thank you very much, Joanne. We now have another question from the UWI TV um, site. And this is, this is for Yuri. What resources are currently available for creatives to build resilience in this time through UNESCO? Um, this is a, a, a formidable organization. We have a global representation with even the possibility for skills transfer. Yuri, what resources are currently available for creatives to build resilience in this time through UNESCO? And, and I suppose Ola Inka could also respond. But Yuri, um, over to you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, well, UNESCO, you know, what UNESCO is doing, we're creating platforms for cooperation. I mean, through various uh, networks and uh, also funding opportunities that are exist within the conventions, UNESCO conventions. We don't have a specific funding, you know, to provide to artisans, to creatives, you know, at this time specific dedicated funding because UNESCO is uh, the intergovernmental agency. We are not the front, 
So we are not flexible with our uh, budget and programming. We are basically influenced by, by our state members. Uh, but nevertheless, I think that, you know, as, as I shared with uh, national commissions for UNESCO and also directors of culture, uh, there are opportunities exist within the UNESCO conventions, uh, particularly the World Heritage Convention, the Intangible Heritage Convention, and also International Fund for Cultural Diversity that actually extended the deadline, the IFCD, extended the deadline until 16th of June, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So there is an opportunity, direct opportunity actually, to uh, support creative industries within that um, funding. Um, I mean, if, if necessary, I can uh, uh, send the, the guidance, you know, how to apply to IFCD uh, with the examples that we have in the Caribbean uh, that link mostly to the cultural policies, uh, revisions and development, but also to creative industries and many more examples that are coming from Africa um, so that can be shared. Uh, there is an emergency fund, you know, emergency heritage fund that is created under UNESCO, but that deals mainly with uh, hurricanes, I mean, with dis disasters, uh, natural and man-made disasters, not with um, pandemics. So we're still, we still in this, uh, this mode where we can, you know, we're trying to assist to our member states uh, and the civil society with the uh, you know scattered resources that UNESCO is having. Um, so that's what I wanted to to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuri. Uh, reminding viewers that they can pose questions to us on Facebook Live and on the chat on uwitv.org, and also via WhatsApp. The number is one two four six two three one eight four three zero. Uh, I'm going to pose a question here. Perhaps Dr. Hickling would want to take this one. Question for UWI-TV from the UWI-TV website. We often hear reference to the orange economy, the cultural industries, the creative industries, and also cultural and creative industries. Does it really matter what we call it? Absolutely. It, it, it matters a great deal. In fact, um, each, each one that you use means something very, very different and very, very specific. And people who know what they mean, when you use them interchangeably and you use them inter incorrectly, they are very clear that you are not aware of um, the various meanings and how um, they relate to what you intend to do. Um, I usually say that the names are ideological, they have ideological bases. So for example, creative industries speaks to a more, um, I, I want to, to make it as simple as possible, a more neoliberal ethos, a more business-centered ethos. Um, uh, it, it speaks to the issue of um, the business focus where the cultural industry speaks from more community uh, focus that, that deals with issues of intangible culture and so on. And the decisions that each country makes with regards to the names that they use is an indicator of the direction in which they wish to take their cultural and creative industries. And the orange economy is actually a name coming out of the multilateral agencies, IDB, World Bank, etc. So when we use that, we have to be clear about the politics behind the use of the orange economy in relation to the green economy, in relation to the blue economy. So every one of them makes um, is specifically different and we have we have to be clear about which one we choose and we have to be clear about which one we use thank you very much deborah uh we have another question here from the uwi tv website uh and it's it's a question you know about inclusion and perhaps we want to um ask ola Inka this question, how do we better include persons in the cultural industry 
in our social security safety nets. Since the sector is in its infancy stage, should persons have to contribute the same percentages to social security programs? Um, perhaps we, we, it, is, it goes right back to the context of the status of the artist. Olenka? Thank you, Sonia. That's a very interesting question. Um, and I think it also feeds into a comment that uh, Dr. Hickling made about people thinking, or rather, the, you know, that uh, the cream rises to the top and an artist should be looked after. I, it really does go back to the status of the artist question, because if a country has laws and policies in place as relates to the working conditions of artists, then those laws and policies would be very clear as to what the contributions would be given the, 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 the precarity of some of the artist, um, how artists work and also the conditions under which they work. So it's not a yes or no question. It, it really is, sorry, it's not a yes or no answer. It really is um, dependent on what uh, particular policies and measures are in place um, and if there aren't any policies or measures, then if you are a business in the creative and cultural industries, do they recognize, for example, um, the, the way that your cash flow runs? Um, you know, if you happen to be in the theater business, uh, you're not going to have a constant cash flow um, as, as, you know, someone who is selling regular goods and well, selling goods and services like foods, for example. Um, there will be dips in your cash flow. There will be moments when uh, you won't be earning as much. So, so if you're going to make contributions, do the existing measures recognize that because you work in the cultural and creative industry sector, there are going to be moments when uh, you know, there's, there are going to be moments when you can't make the same level of contribution as you should, as you could, um, as when you have a full cash flow. So it really is a legislative issue. Um, and this is mm -hmm. why uh, the advocacy part of it is so important, because uh, although many countries may have signed this, the, the, the convention or have signed the convention and are obligated to implement the um, articles related to the status of the artist, they may not be prioritizing those. Um, and many times creative and cultural industries are lumped under general, uh, medium, small and enterprise policies um, and also are supposed to benefit from medium, small and enterprise policies. But because of the way that, that our businesses run and the way that we work in the sector, we generally tend not to benefit from those measures. Uh, so that would be my, my answer to that question. Thank you very much, Olayinka. Reminding the audience that we can take your questions on Facebook Live, on the chat on uwitv.org, and via WhatsApp, 1246-231-8430. Um, and of course, th this question is for Dr. Howard. We've got another question from the UWITV website. Dr. Howard, how do visual artists and photographers contend with the improvements in quality of technology like smartphone cameras um, and so on, quality editing programs and online courses that average people have at their fingertips? These things are increasing in cost to provide a competitive advantage. Um, Dr. Howard, how would you respond to that? Um, I, I'd, I'd say... Storytelling is the, is, the, is, the, is the answer. Technology is technology, and with technology and digitization, it's everybody will get or learn how to do. How to do and instituting creative uh, license or creativity to whatever you do is another matter. So I see photography as, a, as storytelling. And so... You, you will stand out by the type of stories that you will tell with your, with, your, with your stuff. So it becomes about you, how you brand yourself, and the kind of art that you create. Because a lot of people don't see photography as art, but it is art. And it's a very creative process. And it's a very powerful storytelling tool. And just like a song, the better the song, 
uh, uh, it's usually about a great story. Just like a song, photography is about storytelling. Forget about the technology. We, te we, we spend too much time on technology and focusing on the, the, the greatness of, of the technology. And then we lose the message or the story in the, in the technology. And so it's important not to worry about uh, competition from everybody because they can shoot a, 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 a digital camera or a, a smartphone and frame a story. Learn the art of storytelling in terms of photography and you'll be cool. Thank you very much, Dennis. We have another question here from the UWI TV website. Uh, this person is asking, what about spiritual health and spirituality in the creative process? Is this not part of health in addition to the mental and the physical? And I, I suppose this relates to Dr. Howard's presentation, but um, if anyone else wants to respond, certainly. Um, surely do so. Dr. Howard? Um, repeat the question mm -hmm. again. <laughs> so the, the question is, what about spiritual health and spirituality uh, okay. in the creative process? Isn't that as important as mental health and physical health? But I, I did oh mention God. spirituality. Uh, there's a difference between spirituality and, 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 and religion, and uh, I will focus on the spiritual part of it. Spiritual part of it is where you get in touch with self and the universe, and meditation is one of, one of those uh, avenues to, to achieve that. So I think it is very important for the spiritual aspect to be, to be present. And I'm also thinking that depending on who you are, and where religion is in your life. That part of it is also very important. So I, I would agree with, the, with the, the person who asked the question that apart from physical and, and mental, spiritual is also important. And for those who are religious, religion is also very important. Thank you very much, Dr. Howard. Uh... We have another question here for Dr. Tull from the UWI TV website. And the question is, would virtual carnivals and festivals become part of our new normal when social distancing protocols are not as strict? In fact, it's yes, a two-part question. Okay. Um, and, and I will pose the second part after you answer the first part. Don't All right. So I suppose um, to some degree it will be, to some degree, because it's important to remember that within the festival context, apart from the contemporalizations that we have, we still have the traditions. And as I mentioned, with respect to the heritage and the community-based um, types of festivals, within some of the festivals such as carnival, the carnival type celebrations, you also find those elements lying there and may not necessarily be as um, responsive to going into a virtual um, full online environment as we saw there with the Zymeca example or, or voice. So I have to answer that with a caution to say that it, it can be done, but everyone has to look again at their USP, their unique selling point. What is the what is what makes them unique? And I go back again to my point about that culture ad. The idea of stories will help to determine um, what kind of engagement you can have out there in virtuality. Um, for uh, for carnival, as we've seen the the entities out of Jamaica and to some degree Barbados and Trinidad testing, um, it may work particularly for those who find that appealing. That is usually your Generation Z, the younger one. Um, but certainly for those who may not find that very appealing, um, we have a responsibility to then think about how else we can engage them. And I, I believe the solution there will be the stories um, in terms of how we go about telling those and uh, what kinds of engagement we believe we can come up with in relation to those stories. And what's the second part? 
The second part is how do you view this new dynamic to the creative and cultural industries, this virtual carnival and festival dynamic? How do you view it? Okay. Well, I, I overall for me, I think it is, I think it's healthy. And I think it's healthy because it creates a scenario that, that forces those in governance to have to engage in things that we have talked about for so long. Um, everyone who is here, my co-panelists, would all agree and probably can think back on when we started to talk about digitization and the need um, for the engagement of digital platforms, and particularly from our colleague who represents um, the copyright organization. Um, the idea of digital sales and how we would go about monetizing this has been, these have been issues within the region for very long, since Adam was a lad. And so on that level, I, I welcome it. As an academic and as a teacher, I also do, because what it has done now, it has opened up. It has opened up the world, in a sense, um, in terms of being able to access persons and being accessed by persons that we would have normally told ourselves we needed that physicality. And most importantly, it is to be remembered that COVID, in a sense, has given us or uh, forced us to really seriously contemplate our futures, which our younger generations already embrace. Um, they are the ones that are happy on a phone and pressing and looking and engaging. And, and whilst we are dabbling on Facebook, and I remember Deborah, is it Deborah sharing this with me? Um, I saw actually she posted it online. You know, they're, they're already in TikTok world. And, and so these kinds of, of settings and scenarios um, create new opportunities. We have to get on board now to be sure that they are being monetized in a way to the benefit of the creators and the content producers. Thank you, Dr. Toll. I, this question is for Deborah. Uh, um, from the or have fun. What advice do you have for upcoming artists? I'm going to have to ask you to repeat that. My internet was going in and out at the moment. Can you, can you just repeat the question for me, Sonia? Sure. There may be upcoming artists who do not have the resources to employ a marketing team or have sponsors. What advice do you have for upcoming artists? For upcoming artists, I, I would suggest, as Dr. Howard did, that um, they themselves have to become au fait with ways in which they can engage their markets um, directly. Uh, marketing professionals and marketing professional services are reasonably expensive and um, there's a lot that people can do to do their own promotions. Uh, they just need to be able to learn how to do that. There And there are lots of resources that teach people how to actually go about those processes. Um, I, so that would basically be uh, the, what I would say. And um, they need to invest in themselves as well. They need to be able to invest in some of the programs that will teach them how to do the things that they, they need to that they need to do. Um, so they need to take the time and the time that they now have to um, learn how to engage with issues to do with social social media engagement, to learn about advertising, to learn about public relations, to learn too about tradition engaging with traditional media, because they now have to find ways to get their let's say it's music, get their music to traditional um, media and and get the attention of traditional media in doing so. Uh, so they, they have, again, it's about balance. They have, they, they are going to have to spend some time working mm -hmm. some things out. You're saying, then? Yeah, yeah, I was just uh, reiterating what Debbie said. Uh, as I'd mentioned in the presentation that because of COVID-19, the internet is the best friend of creatives and for almost anybody who wants to learn anything. This, this, this webinar is a case in point. There's a lot of 
good information being circulated about creativity, about marketing, free of cost. It's on Facebook every day. All of the big agencies, from website developers to music marketers, they are doing these kinds of stuff. So that's one way to get it. There's also YouTube. There's also uh, courses from, from MOOCs like Coursera, uh, uh, Udemy. All of these are free courses where you can learn digital marketing, social media development, graphic arts, uh, engineering, songwriting, all of this. And all of this is free. For, 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 the, for the, the MOOCs, you, if you want to, you can pay the money to get the certification. But you can complete the course and learn and get the knowledge without, without pay, paying any money. And so this is the best time to be online and use Google and you will learn anything that you want. And then, and then at a point where you are able to afford expert knowledge, avail yourself to that. Uh, Dr. Niall, I'm, I'm sorry to, um, but I wanted to respond to, to the question that you had posed to Dr. Tull about the issues um, of, of, the, of the artists and the festivals um, and online festivals. It was Dr. Lantonette Steins at the meeting at the, um, the meeting the other day, the CARICOM meeting of, of directors of culture that made the point though that while the digital realm is so important, the very ethos of artistry is the touch and feel and the engagement with an direct engagement with an audience. Again, it's about balance. We have to find ways in which, and, and that's what stimulates that, 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 that thrill that you get from the performance, that thrill that you get from the forward and hearing, you know, people call your name and, you know, just the, that excitement. That, that is also an important part of the performance ethos, of the sharing of information and even of the, the generation of content. Uh, so we, again, it's about balance. We have to be able to balance too. Yes. Might I come in there, um, Sonia? Sure, Dr. And I, and I think it's important that I endorse what Deborah is saying there. Um, and this is why I kept emphasizing right now in this time, because for me, the question of resilience is, is one about futures, but something has come at our doorstep that is forcing us to contemplate those futures in the now. And to be quite honest, this is what strategy is about. And, and this is something that myself and Deborah, we, we share that view extensively um, in terms of, of how strategic planning can actively help you to get that balance that she's speaking about. Um, I, I want to just add that to my response to connect back to what she's saying. One has to really underscore the importance of balance. And, but at the same time, or and at the same time, because it's not a but, it's really about also that looking at the down the road in the now. And part of that looking at the down the road in the now is really trying to see how you can begin to independently propel yourself along, not out of, because we're not in charge. I suppose this is where the spirituality is, comes in. God knows best what will happen here. But certainly to propel yourself along and almost, as the Trinities were saying, in spite of, for spite of, whilst our governments try to get the necessary in terms of that praxis, that balance in play, should anything like this happen again, that we are at least standing on the necessary infrastructures. Thank you very much. May Dr. I come Tull. in? May I sorry. come in there, Doctor Naya? Sorry, sorry, Ola Inka. I'm about to ask a question. We have a number of questions okay. lined up from the UWI TV side, so I'll come back to you. Um, this okay. question is about the local artist industry associations, and you might want to take this, Ola Inka. Local artist industry associations, example, JAFTA in Jamaica. Um, have a significant role to play in developing the local market post-COVID, but many need financial support. 
what about the private public sector collaborations with local industry groups? Do we want to encourage that? Um, I got part of the question because you are dropping in and out, but I think it's, it's do we want to encourage collaboration between local organizations and public sector groups? Yes, and also the question of the significant role to play. Is that the question? Um, in because the, you're breaking the, up. The question is that exactly as you have said, what about the private... Okay, um, I don't know if you're hearing me. Um, I I can take it. We're sorry. hearing you, Olayinka. But okay, Dr. Hickling, okay, I'll, what about I'll try and respond on because I didn't hear the full question. Olayinka, I'm gonna ask. I think Dr. the Hickling role of it. industry is. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. See, the role of industry associations is uh, is is very critical. Um, simply because, as has been said previously. Uh, public sector would wants to speak to organizations and not to individuals. And so if you're going to advance any kind of program, policy, or measure um, that you would like to see implemented on behalf of your industry association, then you have to be organized. But it's not good enough just to come together as an association of persons who have an interest and you don't have a plan, you don't have a strategy, and it's quite important you know, it's understandable that most associations are nonprofit. So the first, the first order of business would be to identify how are you going to fund the activities that you plan to do, and what are those activities. Now, you know, we we I think, and I, Dr. Hickling can speak to this. Um, since the advent of COVID, there seems to have been quite a proliferation of um, associations coming up in Jamaica specifically. Um, we have the established ones that we all know, uh, Jan, Jaria, JCAP, etc. Um, but in terms of having an organized civil sector, um, we are still somewhat lacking there. So if we are going to approach public sector as a group of associations in the creative and cultural industries, we really have to have a solid plan and we need to be properly organized. I think the, um, there are a few associations that are currently uh, in a position to lead on something like that, but in terms of capacity building and understanding where to position yourself within the um, public sector and policy landscape, the newer organizations may somehow lack some experience in that area. So it might be a case of the established organizations leading the charge, but I think it's, it's a much more effective approach if, the, um, if we come together as a coalition of, of associations in the creative and cultural industries and we approach private sector and public sector, as a matter of fact, as one body. Um, you know, the, the adage stronger to get together comes to mind. Thank you very much, Olayinko. Um, because we're almost up on time now, um, literally out of time, I'm going to take the last question here from the UWITV Facebook site. How can we initiate and encourage inter-island creative collaboration? And this question um, for Joanne, where could an arts entrepreneur begin in terms of this um, initiating and encouraging inter-island creative collaboration? Yes, I would suggest if it's a case of being an emerging artist, you're actually on the platform where is a very good place to start on that Facebook in terms of sending calls out to get a sense of who is out there in the sector. In addition to which, most of the islands in the Caribbean now have artist registries, so you can always link within the ministries of culture to also get that kind of listing. But even outside of that, you know, um, utilizing social media is, is, as Dr. Howard said not too long ago, um, social media has become our best friend in a sense. It can also be used um, in this time as a way to, to extend yourself to get into networking and to seek out opportunities for collaboration. Um, uh, 
former student of mine who's at Digicel, also a part of the PNO Gates. As a matter of fact, he's the president. Um, he was talking about an initiative that BP Renegades did quite recently where they sent out the music scores to all of their members and they had them rehearse, record, send it back. And then they had a live where it was all played together simultaneously just to give a sense of what really is possible. Um, he also indicated that they shared that with others who were not necessarily part of their orchestra. Um, so that at a time like this, it seems as though that creators are willing to, to engage with each other and to work together to seek out new opportunities. So that's where I would suggest being a good place to start. Excellent And, advice, and I would Dr. like to Tull. just... I would they, just like they, to say, Dr. Naya, that uh, uh, and underscore the um, the artist registry point that Dr. Tool made, because going back to the resources question, there are quite a few, if not most of the Caribbean countries right now actually do have, have resources available for artists. But if you're not during the COVID-19, but if you're not registered, they won't know who you are and what your needs are. So just to underscore that. Excellent reminder, um, Ola Inka. Each country, I know there are probably about six countries right now in the Caribbean that have artist registries. We in Jamaica have our own e-registry. Go online, get the information, please sign up. It is one of the things yes. that will help you in terms of being able to access support. So please, yes, that is important. And I, I'll just pose a last question now from the UWI TV website. Dr. Hickling, will this pandemic spark the thought for serious app and website development programs in the creative industries at the UWI, like TikTok, Vine, etc., and even the creation of a local streaming platform like a Netflix of the Caribbean and Latin America content? Big question there. Uh that's actually a huge question. It's an, it's an important one. And it's actually something that's very important for the university to start now. I certainly hope, and I'm sure the university has started, to um, think about the convergence across campuses and across faculties that will make that possible. I think it's, it's critical, for example, for a CARIMAC um, and an ICS, and it also brings out an issue that's really very important about the legitimization of the humanities. If we can use the technological platforms to be able to identify the importance of our content, um, whether it is our content in books, whether it's our, our, you know, issues to do with our languages, whether it's issues to do with our history, and create those platforms through apps and other um, means by which they can be technologically shared. I think it's something that I know as director of the ICS, you're going to be thinking about very carefully. But now that it's been raised publicly, we should really be looking uh, into the development of some of those areas uh, in, the, in the ways that we best can. Thank you, Deborah. And just to remind our viewers, the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the University of the West Indies, which is celebrating 33 years of existence, has programs at the undergraduate level in music and performance studies, uh, entertainment and cultural enterprise management, and also in cultural and creative industries. And at the graduate level, the MA, um, MPhil, and PhD programs in cultural studies. So we, we are very much with our hands quite at the cutting edge of what is necessary for capacity building in the context of the cultural and creative industries for creatives, for um, scholars, for researchers. And I know that in the context of this, this forum today, we have made it quite clear that whether it is digital music events, whether it is um, the status of the artist, whether it is collection rights, um, we really are making it clear that um, these are not tools or conversations uh, about, you know, frivolity. We, we, are, we are very much educating creatives, very much educating the public about the business of the cultural and creative industries. That when we think about a crisis, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, 
we ought to understand that it is an opportunity, an opportunity for retooling, an opportunity for monetizing, an opportunity for reflecting on the ways in which we must cope with this thing called a crisis. So I want to thank all the presenters this, um, the, in this session. This is our second um, part of the series, um, Humanities in Action Virtual Seminar Series. We have had quite uh, a robust conversation today, and hopefully it will reverberate into the coming weeks and, and years to come as we contemplate the serious issues that have been placed on the table. You can follow the ICS at um, ICS Mona on Instagram and on Twitter. You can follow me at Culture Doctor or my name at Sonia Stanley on Twitter and on Instagram. We are here always to answer your questions, to share with you, and to, to, to push the buttons of policy, of advocacy, of outreach. That is our role. We stand committed as scholars in the humanities for action, for implementation, and for dialogue. I want to thank the UWI TV team, Janet and Maxi. I want to thank, thank the, the Faculty of Humanities, the Institute of Caribbean Studies staff. Uh, we've come to you with our, with our knowledge, with our commitment, and of course, we are there for you if you need to engage with us at any time. Thank you very, very much all. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this program. Remember, you can watch this and all our programs on our website, www.uetv.org, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Also, join the conversation on social media by visiting our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages.